Cataracts, glaucoma, and macular degeneration get all the attention, but there are some other age-related ocular changes that can affect quality of life, but they're just not talked about that much. So let's bring those to light. Today I'm going to be focusing on the front aspect of the eye, mostly the eyelids. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next video where I talk about what's going on inside. Though not technically changes to the eyes themselves, changes to the surrounding tissue, namely the eyelids, can still have an effect on the eyes, ocular health, and even vision. So changes in eyelid structure shouldn't be ignored. Ectropion is a drooping of the lower eyelid, and in severe cases, you may even see that reddish area, which is the inside of the eyelid that is now exposed. I think it's pretty clear that this could lead to dry eye because the eye is exposed even when blinking or when the eye is closed. The issues of exposure are pretty clear, but what I think is less obvious to those outside of the eye care profession is that there is some trouble that comes along when the lower eyelid margin is not in contact with the globe of the eye. The eyelids are lined with meibomian glands that release oil, and this oil is a really important part of the tear film that helps to prevent it from evaporating quickly. Without having the eyelids touch, there's not as much of a squeezing effect pushing the oil out. Also, if that lower eyelid is away from the eye, that oil really isn't getting in there much. This not only makes that exposure and dryness worse, but it can also lead these eyelid glands to atrophy, and those don't grow back. So even in mild cases of ectropion, it might be a good idea to have a surgical correction in order to prevent this snowball effect of dry eye that could be in the future if this is left untouched for too long. Entropion is the opposite. The weakening of the muscles and loosening of the tendons with age can actually cause the eyelid to turn inwards. And you can see that similar issues with the meibomian glands would occur here because that lower eyelid still isn't in the right position. Even worse, the eyelashes are now pointed towards the eye, constantly rubbing, causing worsening irritation, dryness, even corneal ulcers, and infections. For entropion more specifically, short-term solutions could include epilation of the eyelashes, which would just be removing the eyelashes with tweezers, and that needs to be repeated with regrowth, so often every three months or maybe even more frequently than that. Electrolysis is another option to remove eyelashes that would be more permanent, though I haven't seen this done much, so I would really be curious to hear from you if you've had this done and how well it worked for you. For both ectropion and entropion, short-term solutions might include artificial tears and ointments to help reduce the exposure and improve dryness and protect the eye. I've even seen it in Entropion where those eyelashes are rubbing that it seems to kind of gather all those lashes together and push them to the side so they're not pointed as much directly at the eye. Sometimes tape, Botox, or sutures can be strategically placed in order to reposition the eyelids, though these are also usually just temporary measures. For both ectropion and entropion, surgery is typically the chosen long-term solution. Protecting your eyes and skin throughout your lifetime with hats, sunglasses, and sunscreen will always be helpful in slowing down the aging process. Though for some, depending on your genetics or your typical eyelid anatomy, some of these changes may be more likely. Dermatochalasis is another common age-related change due to increased lid laxity. This occurs when the eyelid skin and sometimes fat begin to droop over the eyelid, usually on the outer edge, and sometimes even some of the eyebrow can get involved here. This usually doesn't cause as many issues as entropion and ectropion might, um, unless I've seen it where almost the eyebrow hairs are rubbing against the eye, uh, but that's a really rare case. Uh, but more so what's a concern here is that this drooping eyelid can physically block vision in severe cases. This is treated surgically with a blepharoplasty to lift that eyelid up and out of the way of vision. If the condition is mild, it may have little to no effect on vision. And in that case, if someone were to want a blepharoplasty, it would be considered an elective procedure and not be covered by insurance, at least in the US. But 
If it blocks the vision more significantly, insurance can actually cover this surgery to lift it out of the way, but there are some visual field tests needed in order to prove that this will be a necessity to improve the peripheral vision. A person has to take a visual field test with and without the lid taped out of the way on each eye. So that's four visual field tests total in order to prove that lifting that eyelid out of the way is going to make a difference. In this case, this is a test you want to fail if you want blepharoplasty covered. Blepharitis is inflammation of the eyelids, and though this can affect anyone at any age, it is more common as we age. And one study showed that 37% of people above the age of 65 have some form of blepharitis. Blepharitis can cause irritation, redness, and flaking on the margin of the eyelid, and one of the causes is blocked meibomian glands, or meibomian glands with thickened oil. That oil is not able to be released as well, and if it is, it's thick and doesn't work quite properly, and sometimes it's so backed up that those glands begin to atrophy, leading to this inflammation. It can also occur due to increased buildup of debris and bacteria on the eyelid margins, and one of the causes may be reduced dexterity with age, or that we're just not paying enough attention to our eyelid margins throughout our lifetime, and it eventually gets to a point where it can catch up to us. I don't think anyone's really to blame here. We don't always think about our eyelids, but if you really think about it, we brush our teeth twice a day, so we should at least be paying attention to our eyelid health and cleansing that area at least once a day with water and a mild cleanser. But for someone who has blepharitis, eyelid cleansers may be needed more than once a day, and they may require certain over-the-counter products, even tea tree oil-based products, as well as frequent warm compresses, artificial tears, ointments. There's even a place for topical and oral antibiotic and anti-inflammatories, as well as omega-3 supplements. Last but definitely not least is dry eye. It's so easy to forget and a lot of times this falls to the wayside even with doctors. I think part of the reason is people experience dry eye symptoms but they don't always equate it with dry eye. Sometimes the people's eyes will be watering excessively so they don't think they're dry. But imagine this, you're having a staring contest what do you think is gonna happen? The eyes are going to begin to water. It's a reflex in response to the eyes being too dry. Also, sometimes people don't know what to get for their dryness and they may reach for the nearest or cheapest over-the-counter product. There are so many to choose from and it's hard to know what to do. So often people self-treat and don't always choose the right thing. I'm looking at you, Visine. And another thing, I think sometimes it falls to the wayside because there are often bigger fish to fry and Doctors run out of time in this discussion or they wanna focus on what's really important in the moment and it keeps getting pushed aside. So I really wanna talk about it today. The truth is that dry eye can be a big issue for people of all ages and can sometimes affect quality of life without people even realizing it. And this has only been made worse by the boom in computer and cell phone use that reduces our blink rate from about 15 to 20 times per minute to more like five to 10 times per minute. Dry eye is something that becomes more common and worsens with age, not just because of those changes in eyelid laxity and blepharitis that we've covered already, but also due to hormonal changes, particularly for women. Not to mention, it's a side effect of many medications, and people are more likely to take medications as they age, and it's a complication of chronic health conditions, again, more likely to affect the elderly population. So the best thing to do first is to be conscious of it. Realizing that dry eye is an important issue worth discussing and managing and getting under control with your doctor can not only lead you to have an improved quality of life sooner, but it may also protect you from the long-term damages that can occur with dry eye, like meibomian gland atrophy. It will also help you to advocate for yourself if your doctor is focused on other things or isn't spending the time discussing treatment options that may improve your dry eye and quality of life. 
There are so many treatment options for dry eye that I'll be making a separate video to cover those, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. But I'll just say, the generic treatment with over-the-counter artificial tears is rarely enough to control dry eye and just controls the symptoms as opposed to treating the underlying problem. Nowadays, treatments range from the simple over-the-counter products to an array of prescribed eye drops that reduce inflammation, to daily routines that include eyelid hygiene, compresses, massages, and ointments, to in-office procedures to express and rejuvenate the meibomian glands, to having your own blood drawn and turned into an eye drop that is specific to you. Did any of these conditions take you by surprise or have you experienced them yourself? Don't forget to subscribe for part two of this video, as well as other ocular health content, tips, and news. Click here for more about dry eye and thank you for watching. I hope to see you next time.